Good morning. The reading is from Isaiah 28, verses 11 to 13. Very well then, with foreign lips and strange tongues, God will speak to this people, to whom he said, This is the resting place, let the weary rest. And this is the place of repose, but they would not listen. So then the word of the Lord to them will become, do and do, do and do, rule on, rule on, a little here, a little there, so that they will go and fall backwards, be injured and snared and captured. This is the word of the Lord. Janice is going to come and uh, read our gospel reading for us. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Good morning. Now, Over the last few weeks, we've looked at some of the things Jesus commanded us to do. In what's called the Great Commission, at the end of Matthew's Gospel, Jesus told his disciples to go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. It's Matthew 29, verses 19 to 20. With the help of the Holy Spirit, that's how the church got started. With the help of the same Holy Spirit, that's how the church continued and grew. Disciples made disciples, people who know and love Jesus, obeying what he commanded us and passing that on so the good news of the kingdom of God becomes known across the earth. But we've realised we're sometimes a little bit fuzzy on exactly exactly what Jesus did command us, which is why we're taking time this term to remind ourselves of the commands of Jesus. Over recent weeks, others have tackled challenging topics like repenting, following Jesus, and forgiving others. Now, did I get an easy ride this week with the subject of Jesus commands us to rest? No, I'm afraid not. I've been doing my research, and we're going to have to take a journey across the entire Bible to understand what this command is about. Although you might define resting as what happens when you stop working, I've discovered that when Jesus speaks about resting, he means a whole lot more than doing nothing. I put all my readings up there. You'll see the uh, ones we haven't got to yet are in grey, but that gives you a plan of where we're going so you can follow the map through. Um, We'll end at our gospel reading. You can see down the bottom we're coming back to it. But let's start there too. So that's the kind of a book ending, the passages we're looking at. Are we weary and burdened? I don't need a special gift of knowledge to give a confident yes to that. Next Sunday will mark four years since I started here. And I've learned some of the stories belonging to people in this place. There's plenty of love and joy and peace. There's plenty of faith and hope and love, and that's brilliant. And I give thanks for that. 
But I'm struggling to think of a single one of us who isn't carrying heavier things too. I know that there are jobs which place intense demands on us, finances which don't always balance, serious and ongoing health issues, concerns about family and friends, and more. If I couldn't sit down with you face to face and name at least one such burden, it would probably mean that I just don't know you well enough yet. With the gift of insight, I suspect I'd see yet more, things you haven't shared widely, things you barely hinted at even to those close to you, perhaps even things you hardly realise yourself which weigh on you but you haven't found a way to put them into words. And of course many of us are ones who've tried to follow Jesus for years or decades. When Jesus offers this call, come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, it should resonate, I think, with almost everyone. I believe Jesus is offering something which is far more significant than just sit down, have a cup of tea and a chat. A cup of tea and a chat is brilliant, but Jesus gives us more than that. So let's begin our run through the Bible, gathering evidence on what Jesus meant by rest. And I'll conclude by trying to pull those threads together. I'm going all the way back to Genesis chapter, well, the the first bit of Genesis. I've got some verses from Genesis 2, but really you're reading from verse 1 onwards. Um, Beginning at the beginning, beginning, because I've heard that's a very good place to start. Now, in Genesis chapter 2, it's the conclusion of the first of the stories about the first account of creation, which started at chapter 1, verse 1. It says, by the seventh day, God had finished the work he'd been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from his work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating he had done. If you'd taken a stroll down into the town centre as part of your permitted exercise during one of the COVID lockdowns, you would have found it almost deserted. It isn't so long ago that that would have been a familiar scene every Sunday If you went down to the town centre now, it would be packed. It would probably be busier than Saturday afternoon. But 30, 40 years ago, I suspect Loughborough is like the places I lived in at the time. And if you went into town in those days, there might be one or two people, but mainly it was just the litter blowing along the pavement. Not so much there. Frankly, I'm still not quite on board with Sunday trading. But there was at least one problem with that old tradition. It led a lot of people to feel that Sunday was boring And to assume that when God rested, it was retreating to lie down on his own in order to recover from a week of hard work. I don't think that's what is meant when it says God rested. God is Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so he's never alone. He can't retreat to be on his own. He's always Trinity. He's always there with himself in a full relationship. If we'd read through Genesis chapter 1, we'd already have seen revealed in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image. So although the Trinity is never spelled out in fullness anywhere in the scriptures, the very first clue comes in the very first chapter that God is never alone because he is Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Psalm 121 tells us that God neither slumbers nor sleeps. I also can't imagine the idea of God getting bored impatiently waiting for his self-imposed rest to be over. God rests, and it is a positive choice. It's not, oh gosh, it's Sunday, I I better not do anything because I'll be in trouble. God chooses to rest, a positive thing. It's not a failure of his strength. It's not a boring period of nothingness. I don't know, even when all the Sunday trading laws were in force, I don't know if we were ever very good about making that time with God. Some of us would... It would be a time of going to church, and some of us, it really would be time with God. But for many people, we took it the wrong way, and it was just a oh, boring Sunday. And that wasn't what God's rest was about. So Genesis chapter 1 and 2, a little bit of evidence. Moving on, not very far, Genesis chapter 3. If you're looking for a Bible verse on work, on the work we have to do, you might turn the page and settle on Genesis 3:17. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat of it. As someone who likes to grow a few vegetable plants, I can tell you there are times when that comes to mind. Painful, through painful toil, you will eat of it. Aching backs, grubby fingers, and then the crop wiped out by slugs anyway. 
But it's not all like that. Work started before the fall. Genesis chapter 3 isn't when work started. If you look back to chapter 2, verse 16, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. The wearisome, frustrating nature of much labour comes after the fall, but it doesn't have to be that way. As well as some trials, it's also true that some of my best moments have been grabbing around in the dirt, caring for my plot. My face can be bent to the soil, but my heart is lifted up to my Heavenly Father. I find it actually a really productive time to pray. My hands are occupied. I'm not getting distracted by the computer sitting in front of me. Oh, I could just check Facebook or the books or anything else around. I'm just there doing a bit of weeding, looking after the plants, and I speak with my Heavenly Father. Work does not have to be the opposite of rest when it produces such delight. Okay, slightly bigger jump now. I've barely turned a page, but now we're going to go all the way to the second book of the Bible, Exodus. At the beginning of Exodus, we meet a man called Moses. God had arranged for the baby Moses to be rescued from the river, which is very fitting for one who's destined to be a rescuer. His name sounds like the Hebrew for draw out, and God will use him to draw his people out of their sojourn in Egypt and on towards the promised land. However, just as the Hebrews had spent much longer than might be expected in Egypt, so Moses took much longer than might be expected to make a proper start on fulfilling his destiny. When he was about 40 years old, he killed an Egyptian, but that didn't spark the revolution. Instead, he ended up running in fear of his life and retreating to the deserts of Midian, 40 years more of exile. And then, after that time, God spoke to him at the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3. As described in chapter 2, verse 23, it's a long period waiting in the desert. How did Moses feel during that long period of being becalmed, sitting there. It was like he was in a, a sh sailing ship on the ocean. Nowadays, all the ships have got motors, and I suppose they probably don't ever run out of fuel, because I imagine they keep an eye on that. But back in the old days, before my time, before your time, when sailing ships were a big thing, sometimes you'd find that the winds died down, and you'd just be sat there in the middle of the ocean, 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 as far as you could see, water, water everywhere, and not a drop to drink, and all of that, because you would be calmed. Moses, I wonder if he felt becalmed in the desert. There he was, the man whose name meant to draw out, who knew he had a purpose, a promise, but who tried and it failed, and now here he was, stuck in a desert, looking after scraggly-looking sheep. Well, God spoke to him. Perhaps you find that you're in a place which feels like a desert. You know that God has called you to something. But gosh, it seems to be taking a long time. Maybe you've made an effort to pursue that and it didn't quite work out and life took an odd set of turns and you're not where you thought you'd be. And you're feeling a bit impatient because you feel like you're in the desert. Are you griping against that, frustrated, just every day grumbling against God? When's it going to be my turn? Or are you perhaps using that time to lay down wisdom, the wisdom you might one day need? Ponder that. But how much are you resting in where God has put you? Are you trusting that where God has you now is exactly where he needs you to be? Moving on, if you've been watching out for climate change stories over recent years, you might find something very contemporary about the phrase, we will not fear though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the very heart of the sea. More recent than Moses, it was still written about 3,000 years ago as the various psalms were penned and collected. Specifically, it's verse 2 of Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. You might know verse 10 of that psalm, which starts, Be still and know that I am God. That's the NIV version, or as another translation puts it, Cease striving and know that I am God. Let's add that to our collection of verses related to rest and move forward. And we now come to the supporting reading we had, which Jenny read for us from Isaiah chapter 28. If you were to step into my office and find someone to stand among all the instruments and other musical gear and the books and the song sheets and all of that clutter, you might spot the first part of verse 12 pinned up on my wall. Rest is a subject I've been interested in for a long time. 
I'm not saying I'm an expert, I've got a lot to learn, but it is something which has been on my heart that actually I do need to learn more about it. We need to learn more about it. Not long after arriving here, um, I sat in my office and just typed up that verse and printed it out and stuck it on my wall. And it's still there to this day. In many ways, this bit in Isaiah is, is really quite sad. Through Isaiah, God is reminding his people of what they have been promised and what they've rejected. They should not only have been people who enjoyed rest, but they should have been sharing it freely with others as part of the knowledge of God. Instead, they've become, frankly, a second-rate power, afraid of the machinations of empire such as Assyria to the north and Egypt to the south. Instead of living in the grace of God's provision, they've fallen into do and do, do and do, rule and rule, a little here, a little there. That's not the glory of God. That's not where they should have been. That's a very mean and petty existence which they come to. By having trusted in their own strength rather than in God's, their weakness had been exposed. And to make a pun which probably isn't found in the Hebrew, they found themselves deep in the doo-doo. I want to take one more step on our thread-gathering mission before we turn to our reading from Matthew. This time we are taking quite a jump forward into the book of Hebrews. It's not about men making tea. It's a fascinating book, which is full of the cultural heritage of the Jewish people, but with a revelation that Jesus is the Messiah. It speaks to believers who are facing sharp choices around following the risen Christ in a climate of potentially violent, actually often violent, persecution. Because of their Hebrew background... It links back again and again and again to their faith traditions, all the stuff which you find in the earlier parts of the Bible. For us, who typically know what we call the New Testament somewhat better than the Old Testament, we have to do some extra homework to get up to speed with what the original audience would have learned over their lifetimes and grasped probably like that when they first read it. They may not have put it into practice straight away because they weren't that dissimilar to us, but they would have known that Old Testament background. I commend chapter 4 to you particularly on the subject of rest. And I want to pick out verse 11. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fail by following their example of disobedience. Whose disobedience? Partly Israel through past history, a people called by God who did great things under his hand, but sadly often also turned to chose to turn from God and to live in disobedience, like the ones Isaiah had spoken to many years earlier. I think the author of Hebrews is also hinting at their contemporary situation, what was going on around for people at that time who should have been learning what it was to rest in God, but instead were getting anxious and nervous, or getting distracted, or taking odd theological journeys into things they shouldn't be doing, all sorts of things, anything, except coming to enter and sit at the feet of God. And I think... Because we've received the book of Hebrews through the gift of the Holy Spirit working through the ages, it's part of our Bible. It's a message to us as well. Make every enter effort to enter into God's rest. Rest is not just a nice little extra we might like to have once in a while, but it's an essential part of what C.S. Lewis summed up as the serious business of heaven. May the word of God, described in verse 12 of that chapter as living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword, operate on us so that we might be people who make the necessary effort to enter into the rest God has for us. Okay, time now to draw things together and conclude. Rest is not something to fall to when we're exhausted, a last resort, or to indulge in when we should be busy somewhere else. It is something we should choose to do as we imitate God, who chose to rest despite being neither weak nor lazy. We found our work came before the fall. We can find something of rest, even in work, when it brings us to delight in God. And also perhaps we should be aware of the dangers of leisure which draws us away from God. Beyond regular patterns of rest, there might be work that God has appointed you to, but which he's not yet ready for you to start. Find peace in a confidence that God will draw you out at the appropriate time, just as he did with Moses. It took a long time, but God did amazing things through that man. Continue to keep the Father's name holy. 
continue to abide in Jesus and continue to be filled with the Holy Spirit. All three are aspects of knowing that God is God and that he is our sufficient and wonderful prize. We should be glad of opportunities to know God's rest and to share it with others. We should not, like those who Isaiah spoke to, settle for life jammed with petty tasks, do, 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 rule and rule, rule and rule, a little here, a little there. Rest is not something which we use so that tomorrow we can do something more important. Entering God's rest is a part of our high calling in Jesus Christ. Jesus calls all of us who are weary and burdened, and I think that might just be about all of us in some shape or form. He calls all of us who are weary and burdened to come to him. Even those who don't feel weary now are likely to get weary as they pick up more life experience. It's almost an inevitability. The older I get, the more I realize the burdens which are around us in life. But the more I realize the wonders of Jesus, my savior too. Jesus doesn't call us to a couch or to a bed but he calls us to a yoke. Not a very familiar word, because we don't tend to go out in the fields yoking oxen together to plough, but that's what it was. It was what oxen wore, not when they were in the stables, but it's what oxen wore when they were set to work in the field. Take my yoke upon you. Jesus' rest is not a cessation of work, an end of work, but a renewal of life as we walk in the steps he guides us, rather than trying to pull Jesus into the places we want to go. Because that's what the yoke was, a way of guiding. The oxen left to their own devices would have wandered around, oh, there's a nice flower, I might nibble on that. They wouldn't have been very good at ploughing, but with the yoke, the farmer would get them going straight lines up and down, which would be wonderful, tilling the ground, preparing it for the seed. Jesus sets us to work, guiding us where he wants us to go. Rest is not a barren landscape of doing nothing, but life flowing through us as we abide in Christ. I didn't put it up here, but maybe another verse you might want to look at is uh, John chapter 15, verses 1 to 8, where Jesus talks about being the vine. But the critical thing about that image of Jesus is the vine that we're told to abide in him, to be grafted into him, to let his life flow through us. Perhaps, slightly radical thought here, we shouldn't even talk of accepting Christ into our lives. But instead, we should talk about accepting Jesus' invitation to come into his risen life. You know what we're like, we talk, accept Jesus into your life if you accepted Jesus, but that is a little bit selfish. It's as if Jesus was come in, just lightly bless us, and then we'll get on doing the things we want. But actually what Jesus calls us to is something far more radical to that, to come into his life, to die through the death he died for us, but then to be risen to life in the life he rose up into. That's the gospel message, come and be found in Jesus. Jesus commands us to rest. May we learn that for ourselves. May I learn that for myself. And may we be equipped to share that with those around us in a world which has plenty of burdens, which make the ones we suffer in this church look tiny in comparison. May we be people who know God's rest and can share that wonderful good news with the world around us. May it be, Lord. Amen.
Blessed.